Welcome to another Red Gaming Tech video, myself and Marta. Today I have a bit of a collection for you, we have a few things to get through. So on our itinerary today we have a statement from AMD regarding the whole RX 560 situation, which of course we discussed yesterday, as well as a couple of bits from Microsoft, including Microsoft Azure and Epic, as well as Windows 10 for ARM. However, let's discuss Microsoft Azure and Epic first, shall we? So we had an announcement from AMD today that we will be getting the first public cloud instances powered by AMD Epic, which of course we've been hearing an awful lot about lately, and we have it in the form of Microsoft Azure, as they have deployed AMD Epic processors in their data centers in advance of a preview for their latest L series of virtual machines. Now this particular family of virtual machines will take advantage of the connectivity support and high core count of, of course, AMD Epic. Now I have a bit of a statement here from Scott Ayler, who is Corporate Vice President and General Manager of Enterprise Solutions, and he had to say, quote, we are extremely excited to be partnering with Microsoft Azure to bring the power of AMD Epic processors into their data center. This is a tremendous opportunity for users to tap into the capabilities we can deliver across storage and other workloads through the combination of AMD EPIC processors on Azure. We look forward to the continued close collaboration with Microsoft Azure on future instances throughout 2018. Now I know some of you are wondering, the instances we are seeing here are going to be running on the AMD EPIC 7551 processor, which has a base core frequency of 2.2 GHz and a maximum single core turbo frequency of 3.0. And it also supports 128 lanes of PCIe connections per processor, which is pretty damn nuts. And it can also process an unprecedented number of NVMe drives directly. So these particular VMs will be available starting at 8 and ranging to 64 vCPU sizes and the largest is actually going to have direct access to a impressive 4 terabytes of memory and are going to support premium storage disks for Azure by default and of course going to be tweaked for a bunch of accelerated networking capabilities and unique capabilities for Epic and Azure working together and basically it's going to be great for storage intensive stuff is basically what all that comes down to. So that doesn't really affect you or I all that much, but it still is very interesting and, of course, good to see the first public cloud instances which are going to be having Epic under the hood. Epic has been very, very interesting indeed, and I'm glad to see it finally being released into the wild, as it were. So, let's move on to ARM and Windows, shall we? So you may recall that the last attempt from Microsoft to pair ARM and Windows together didn't end so well. Well, they're uh, not being put down by a bad experience. They are now announcing that products based on its new ARM approach are almost ready. And, well, one of the reasons that it failed previously is because of the closed wall ecosystem, which, of course, we have seen partially affect Windows 10. Of course, Windows 10 isn't a complete closed wall, but we have seen certain philosophies like that affect the Windows Store and various apps on the Windows Store, or games to be more exact, and we saw a similar effect here where we saw that the only apps available for the platform were being dis dis distributed, excuse me, on the Microsoft Store, which led to a distinct lack of good quality apps that users were used to seeing on their laptops or desktops. So, that does come to an end for Windows 10 for ARM, and that is a, a due to emulators, which of course Microsoft have been dabbling with a lot with the Xbox One's backwards compatibility, and the Windows 10 for ARM will of course enable ARM power systems with CPU, say for example, like the Snapdragon 835, to run most x86 applications. And essentially means that you're going to be getting conversion of x86 code to equivalent blocks of ARM codes. So, you might say, oh, that, that sounds like it could, you know, result in some issues. Well, actually, it's actually going to be stored in, sorry, cached, to be more exact, in memory. So after your initial run, the emulated code will be available right away. So you might see a bit of slowdown and lack of snappiness on the first time. But after that, it will be cached. So it's going to run pretty damn smoothly after that. And of course, it's going to be available on disk as well. Now, system libraries will all be native ARM code, including those loaded by x86 programs. 
Now, despite what I just said about caching and all of that, as with any emulation, any application that is even slightly intensive will see a dip in performance compared to if it was running natively in its normal environment, but it's really hard to say how much is actually going to affect an end user. But with this system in place, it shouldn't be any real noticeable effect at all, but I don't want to say, yeah, 100% won't have that, and then it does, because, well, then I'm the one big on my face. Hopefully it shouldn't, is what I will say. At the moment, we only have two things announced for this particular partnership. We have the Asus Novago laptop and the HP NVX2 tablet. And, well, you might under, well, wonder, under? I don't know what that is, but it's a thing now, apparently. You might wonder, well, okay, that's all great, that's all shiny and wonderful. But what does ARM actually bring to the table? Well, one thing it does do, which is great for mobile applications, is it works absolute magic for battery and of course when you're running your laptop on a train or traveling or just you know using it as a laptop that is obviously what you want to hear you want to get the most out of your battery's life as you possibly can now both of these systems will be make you, making use excuse me of that snapdragon 835 i mentioned earlier as well as an X16 LTE modem, and the HP offering is going to have 8GB of RAM and 256 gigs of storage on its option. However, we also will be seeing in the future something from Lenovo, but we have literally no information on that front. But still, interesting, it looks like this time around the Windows and ARM partnership is not going to end in a horrible dumpster fire, but as with anything, just wait and see. But, uh... It looks like they've learned their lesson from last time around and have found a way to get rid of that Windows Store issue, which, as I said, has been impacting the Windows Store even on PC. It has eased up a bit now. Obviously, it's a little better, but obviously it did really affect it, like, near the sort of peak of the interest when you had, like, you know, Quantum Break and so on coming out on the Windows 10 Store, and that was an absolutely dreadful PC version with numerous problems that I don't want to go into again because it's not really relevant, but I do just kind of edit... Uh, Expand on my point a little bit there. So let's get on to the real money maker, the one that you really wanted to hear, the RX 560. Now, if you want to get the full details on exactly what happened, I do suggest you watch Paul's video from yesterday, which gave all of the information in its entirety. But basically what happened is that, well, they are now offering, that being AMD, of course, two different versions of the same product, the RX 560s. Now, there are now, as I said, two versions, one with 14 compute units and 896 stream processors, and one with 16 compute units and 1024 stream processors. And obviously the one with the bigger specs is the original GPU, and there was no distinction other than the spec sheet that this was the case. They were not labelled differently in China and other countries. A user informed me in the comments yesterday on that video I just mentioned that this is also the case in Croatia, so it might be the case in other countries as well. But at least here in the UK and other countries as well, there was no labelling difference. It's not called the 560D like it was in China. There was no difference other than the spec sheet. So if you are a user who didn't know what they're doing, you just got into PC gaming, you know, your, your mate said, I'll oh, go buy this one, it's, it's the best for your budget, or whatever. You're not going to know what those specs mean, and you're probably not going to look, because your mate said, this is the best one, or you went on PC Part Picker, or whatever. Oh, this is the best one, okay. And you bought it without realising. And it was a bit shady, more than a bit shady, to be honest, from AMD. A little dodgy, to say the least, and they have come under fire for this, to be honest, and rightfully so. So we have now a statement from AMD. And this is actually a bit of an update from AMD, as they did kind of try to fob it off at first, but, you know, that obviously didn't do very much to sort of calm people down after they felt like they'd been misled into buying a lesser power GPU. They now have a statement which reads, quote, It's correct that 14 compute units, 896 stream processors, and 16 compute unit, 1024 stream processors versions 
of the RX 560 are available. We introduced the 14 CU version this summer to provide AIBs and the market with more RX 500 series options. It's come to our attention that on certain AIB and e-tail websites, there's no clear delineation between the two variants. We're talking immediate, sorry, we're taking, excuse me, immediate steps to remedy this. We're working with all AIB and channel partners to make sure the product descriptions and names clarify the CU count so that gamers and consumers know exactly what they're buying we apologise for this confusion this may have caused. So that's great. I'm glad they finally said, look, we're sorry. We This needs to be made clear because that's all they needed to do. That's that's They needed to just label it, call it the 560 Zebra for all you want. It doesn't matter. Make it clear that this is slightly different and then make clear what that difference is so that if a person who doesn't know what they're doing has just been told to buy this by Jimmy or Tom or Pennywise the Clown, doesn't matter, they don't feel like they've been misled into buying a lesser one than they thought they were getting. You know, that's the issue. It wasn't clear unless you look at the spec sheet. And unless you know what you're doing, you A, you probably wouldn't even look. Because why would you? You don't know what any of it means. And if you did, you could be like, okay, you don't know that it's supposed to have X. And even if you see two things on one thing, you'd assume that your mate knows that and has led you to the right thing or whatever. If you even look in the first place, like someone who doesn't know anything about... GPUs is probably not even going to be on the specs page if their friend has recommended them or whatever situation it happens to be. So yeah, I'm glad they've apologised for the situation. It's a little bit off to throw AIBs completely under the bus, but uh, you know at least they're saying yeah we're going to deal with this. And people are understandably annoyed, as I already said, and they're definitely comparing it to Nvidia. There have been numerous. Uh, comparisons to the 970 memory segregation from a few years back as well as to the 1063 gigabyte. Um, unfortunately there doesn't seem to be any way for you to get any like any sort of compensation or any form of restitution from AMD if you have indeed ended up purchasing one of the lower end ones without realizing that's what you got. Um, if you want to know if you did you can run GPU Z and it will tell you exactly what your stream process account is, you'll know which one you have if you don't know. But even if you do know, AMD have not said anything about making it right. So at least you'll know which one you have, but you can't really actually do anything with that information. So there you go, a bit of an update from AMD. Not great that this situation happened in the first place. It should have been made clear from the start, to be honest, but no point bitching about it now. All we can do is make our voices heard that this is not okay, don't do this again. This should never happen. Like, this is pretty misleading, to be honest. So, that shouldn't have happened in the first place, but they have, excuse me, they have apologised. So, we can just kind of move forward and really, really hope that they don't do this again. And I do hope they do more than just apologise and throw AIBs under the bus, but to be honest, I don't think that will happen. I'd love to be proven wrong in that regard. But, with all that said, that is me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.